like this. There's a lot of green in mine. There's a lot of green in yours. And he's wearing a green shirt. <laughs> I love this. We are in so the opposite unplanned. way. Yeah. 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 <laughs> We're in the opposite way. It's right. We are Martin, who's with us? Who's with us today, tonight? Who can tell what time it is anymore? <laughs> we have Emiliano with us. Emiliano is building a very interesting company in South, in South America. And I think this discussion is going to be great. We're going to learn a lot. <laughs> Welcome. Emiliano Segura. It's very nice to meet you. How are you doing? Hi, Martin. Hi, Michael. Uh, very nice to meet you too. Uh, I'm so glad to be here. Um, very fine. I'm in Mexico right now, just uh, starting my day. So... That's it. Thank you. Thank you for That's inviting awesome. me. And we're, can you give our, our viewers a little bit of your background for some context? Like you're not always in Mexico, are you? Uh, I'm originally from Argentina. I, I right. was there until next the last year. I was uh, in, in, from when I started, I started uh, studying like industrial engineering in, in Cordoba, Argentina, where I am from. Uh, that's where I met uh, Agustin. Uh, my my partner and uh, we started at 18 years old uh, another business cleaning business for for enterprise like a b2b business of, of, of cleaning services at 18 years old he was 16 i think and that's when i started working and partnered with Agustin. then i was friend of, of Juan. Juan Tamirano is my other partner, the CEO of the company. Agustin is the president right now. And I, I was friend of him from my childhood. And we sat one day like drinking some beer and it was like, okay, let's do something big. I love technology. I love what you're doing. and Let's start something new. And that's how we started Clico. Clico is now uh, uh, Amazon level logistics for e-commerce companies in Latin America. Basically, we deliver packages for 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 e-commerce, um, and yeah, in in the middle we have some interesting interesting journey like around around all our, our history. Um, when we were developing Clico at first, it was not what is right now. It was like a delivery platform, and in the middle of the of the of the journey, it, it's still Rappi and Globo. I don't know if you know them, but they weren't in Argentina still. So we were like free field, just starting a new business that no one knows in Argentina. And it was like, okay, we are going to be the first. Since we started developing it until we finished developing it, it there were three companies that do the same as us with a lot of money, by the way. <laughs> and, and we had to figure out how to compete with them. And it was like pretty hard at first. Like we started like going to cities they weren't uh, making some cash on delivery that they weren't, but they do, they weren't doing that because it was much more difficult than 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 normal delivery. Um, so yeah, well, Yana, can I can, can I jump in for a second because I want to I want to back up if you don't mind. For people that don't know, maybe you can talk about just what the startup landscape looks like in Argentina. Right. And also, like you started a company when you were 18. Is that normal for people graduating with an industrial engineering degree? Do you know what I mean? I want people to get a better sense for like the environment in which you started this company. We'll get we'll get to Clicko in a few. OK, but I want people to understand the environment first so they can understand how it grows up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have to disappoint you, but I'm not where I graduated from industrial engineer. I am a dropout, as most of funders are. <laughs> I drop out the uh, uh, for You're not disappointing me. You're making me happy. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> I, I, I'm, Why am I disappointed? I, I dropped out uh, um, university at, at uh, fourth year at 22 years old. Like I was working and studying like for four years. I had to to sacrifice a lot of friends' time, training yeah. time. I love like martial arts, so that, that's like a pretty of, of personal me. Um, and the landscape in Argentina, it's, it's been growing very, very much like in the last two years from, from where we get to, to YC. We were like the seventh company in the whole Argentina that got in uh, Y Combinator, this, this accelerator from Silicon Valley. And right now there are more than 30 companies that have got uh, in, in Y Combinator. So it has grown very, very fast in the last few years. The thing is that in Argentina, it is 
much more difficult to manage your money, to grow, to have a company because uh, the laws are very, very like restrictive and I, I don't know how to say the word like don't to don't to sound like weird but but yeah the the, the taxes are really really high like yep. they they say that there is a common say in Argentina that if you do all the things right as the law says you will never win money earn money but but <laughs> it's impossible like mathematically impossible you start like assuming plus taxi plus taxi plus tax and then you will end like below below zero with with red numbers it is like uh impressive but it is also truth so got it so we can I, we, can we grow in, so a, so in a hard environment sorry is, is your company domiciled in argentina then or is it domiciled like in miami do you know what i mean no we have like uh, the we have very subsi- a lot of subsidiaries in every country we operate, but yeah. we have a, a mother in, in Delaware. Yeah, we have a Delaware, Delaware. Where, where it operates all the, the subsidiaries. That's what I thought. Okay, and what was it like being a kid, right? So you drop out of school and you get into Y Combinator. I don't know what the order is, right? But what was it like going from Cordoba in Argentina to Silicon Valley and then participating in Y Combinator? The, fir- like, the first did it time, your expectations? Did it beat your expect? Like, were you just like, "Whoa, I can't believe I'm here"? Or were you just like, "Okay, let's get on with this thing" because I got a lot of stuff to learn? Like, what was it like? That, that 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 question is a good one and has a lot to do with with the first time we got we got um, because we applied to YC like five times, four times, sorry. But the first one was like really, really awesome. It was like, "Oh, I can't believe that!" And we were in Cordoba in. Literally, like as cliche in our garage, like I was working with Agustin and and another co-founder we had in that, in that moment that was the developer, um, and we got filled the application like with no hope, and two months later it arrives an, an email. We were working and hey, nice to meet you. It sounds interesting what you're doing in Argentina. Let's meet you in three days in Silicon Valley, and we were like. Uh, three days we have like uh, we have like 15 hours travel just to get to, to silicon valley so it, it was pretty crazy but yeah we went of course that, that's where wow. we bought the tickets and we said okay let's let's do it we went on a sunday it was friday when we got the email we went on sunday and on monday we have the the interview um and yeah it, like? it it, it, it overcame all of my expectations. Expectations. It was like really awesome, and we didn't know nothing about it. That that was the the most hard part because we were like, okay, let's prepare a pitch and and let's take demo to them so they can see our app, how we're doing. And when we arrived, a guy says from us hey, it is a 10-minute interview with no pitch, no no demo, just I will ask you questions and you will answer me questions for 10 minutes. You can go over that and I will catch you if I want. And we were, okay, <laughs> you're changing my plans. But it was it was really awesome and we learned a lot. And the thing that I more more got from, from YCR, the advice that those guys, that, that those interviewers that like, Michael Siebel, the president of YC, gave us that time uh, because I think he helped us deliver uh, or figure out what our business model would be to get successful. And but you said you applied five times. Does that mean you went through the program five times, or we went three. five times? Then the last time, <laughs> sorry, three times. We went three because in the middle one we were pivoting and we didn't know very well about what we are what we were doing so yeah they didn't call us in the meal and but then we could figure out how to explain it better and that's how we got in uh december of 2020 december of 2020 oh wow so was it remote or were you there in person it was remote the last one was remote mm-hmm. yeah we went two times personally and it was much more harder <laughs> but but then the last one was remote and and it was pretty good also because we could 
have the this YC program, but also to operate the company and run the company. So it was like better in in cost in matters of efficiency. Yeah, for sure. What what makes it hard? Do you know what I mean? To have a company? No, 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 no. The, the company <laughs> part, I, I completely understand. I'm talking about Y Combinator. Like what makes that hard? You said it was harder when you were there in person. Is it just like super pressure? Super, 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 super. I don't know how many supers I would put in my in my phrase, but it is super pressure. Like all 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 the founders are in in a in the coaches like in a, in, a, in a room and all waiting like oh, what should i do i should take a, some yoga i would meditate i would start, practice my pitch but then when you got in there is no pitch available for for you because they just like okay what you do okay what's your company about and how do you make money and what's your client and what do you do with your competition how do you, how would you win your competition and there are some things that for sure you won't prepare and they will ask you just that. Mm-hmm. So it is, it is, I think, very difficult. But in the end, I think they um, focus on the founders more than in the business because, as you may know, in 10 minutes it's not to- so easy to have a full picture of what impossible. you're doing and yeah, yeah impossible. impossible pretty impossible so I, so I yeah like the, it is i like the idea that they don't make you pitch your business because to be fair before you go through a thing like y combinator whatever your business was when you got there is not when it's going to be when you leave so it's really just like is emiliano is augustine are the other partners are you guys serious about this or are you just a bunch of clowns and you're not and you're super serious right so they're like okay you're in exactly yeah like Definitely like traveling 15 hours for a 10 minutes meeting. <laughs> that's de- that's de- yeah. I think that definitely proves that you are ready and you are in for sure. <laughs> yeah, no, but in our defense, we didn't know it was a 10 minute business. We, we thought it would be much more like big shit, big show, and, and other things. So, so Super interesting. I want to go back to Clico, right? So, when you first started, what was the original problem you were trying to solve? Like, were there other 3PLs in Argentina? Did you think it was just going to be an Argentinian business? Or did you look at it and just think, whatever we're building now, we want it to be like pan Latin America as well? It's a bunch of stuff in there. But you know what I mean? Like, what was the original idea? Yeah, the, the original idea, the first first one was a, a food delivery app. Like, literally, like Deliveroo, like uh, Food Panda and those ones. Um, but as we immigrate, I, I want to tell you a little, little story in the middle, because when we were doing this delivery app, uh, you know, the, the bags, the terminal bags that, that, that all the riders have in, in the back. Um, and we were trying to figure out how to buy some bags for Clico in Argentina. And there were two options, buy from China, like 7,000 bags at Thirty thousand dollars, and we are we're literally in a garage, so we we wouldn't do that option. And the other option was um, a provider from Argentina that that has like very bad quality and very high prices. But my my COO Juan, my partner, so, said to me like, "We can build this stuff. We, we can we can create a bag. We can build our own bags. So that's what we do." We, we, we build like 30 bags for us. That was more than, more than enough. And the bags went so well, but so well that we started selling bags to the other delivery apps in Argentina. <laughs> so like we started uh, selling to Rappi, Pedidos Ya, Globo, Uber Eats. To all of them, we were the first providers of bags. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we earned money with that business and we spent it in Clico. And that was how, how we financiate ourselves. <laughs> Plus so some money that my father gave us. Um, but hurt. yeah, it, was, it, it is a pretty awesome story. <laughs> and? Definitely. Yeah, then what happened after that? <laughs> after, after that, we started uh, export, exporting bags to Uruguay, to these apps. So <laughs> the, the company of, of, the, of building bags grow a lot manufacturing bags grow, okay. grow a lot but when we got in yc with clico we stopped like we we, we sell this company the, the half of the company to our some, some new partners that manage and run it 
so we can focus on Clico. And and yeah, and about your question, in the middle of that one, we were like just pivoting from the food delivery app and we had this this bag uh, manufacturer. We started to not only selling the bags to these delivery apps, but also uh, delivering the apps, the bags, like uh, shipping the bags to the couriers, to the riders. So that's how we started like creating our first uh, MVP model that mm-hmm. was like um, pickup points. So we dropped the bags in pickup points and the rider came when he was working all day. So he came, he picked up the bag and he put it in and keep working. And with that model, uh, uh, one of the, of these delivery apps could like close all their offices and, and, and physical points they had that were a travel because uh, all the all the riders went to to argue to ask for more money or whatever so it was like a really problem for for this delivery app and they could close all of them just because we delivered the bags to the riders and we had no responsibility with with the delivery app so riders couldn't make us problem but and and yeah that was how we started like shipping doing shipping the the first mvp and was that a, was that purposeful at that point? Had you already decided that Clicko was going to be a logistics business, or did you think like, oh, now we learned something, and I think this is the thing we should focus on? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, not at all. We, we didn't like when we started Clicko. We didn't say, okay, it will be a logistic company. No, no, no. It, it was like we were we all our journey. We were taking opportunities, and the doors that opened, we went through the the. The most, the ones that we saw that were going to be, were going to grow. So, so yeah, no, no, we started the, like with these bags and then we say, okay, we can integrate with this, with this uh, delivery app e-commerce because they, they sell the bags to the riders. Right. So when we integrate, we add another, another like part of the, of the platform. And then, Hey, there, there has been a lot of, a lot of bags right now we are delivering a lot so we need something someone to help us with the shipping so we integrated to to a, a shipping company in argentina and and that's how we we started like creating the model that we have right now and what is that model right now right now basically we we, we provide an end to end solution for for e-commerce sellers so we store the inventory of the seller. Um, we pack, pick and pack the, the, the packages. When the order gets in through the integration, through the API, we pick and pack. And then we deliver the package uh, in, in the countries, in all the territory, in 100% of the territories we operate. So like if you sell something in Argentina, because you are selling through an e-commerce, there is not a, a local geography. You have to sell in all the country. That's how, that's what we have to provide, like a service that can go to everywhere in the countries we operate. And, and which countries are sorry. those? I want to get a sense for, like, if I talk about Southeast Asia, I can t- tell you there are seven countries and six hundred and seventy million people. In the places where you're operating, right? How many countries are there? And then approximately how many people are there? In Argentina, in Latin America, there are maybe it, it must be pretty pretty similar to to Middle East, but there are like 20, 20 to thirty countries. Um, but the biggest ones are literally five, maybe yep. that we have. You have like Brazil yep. first, but it has a different language, so it is not Latin America, but South America, yep. and. And then in Latin America, you have Mexico, Argentina, Colombia, Chile, and you may stop counting the biggest one. Then you have, of, of course, Peru, Paraguay, Uruguay, um, Ecuador, uh, but the, the biggest ones and, and the most volume of, of shipping of e-commerce are, are Mexico, Argentina, Chile, and Colombia. Yeah. So I wanted to, the reason why I asked you this is not just to figure out like how big it is, but also to make the distinction. A lot of people, when they look at Southeast Asia, they just think one monolithic market, right? A bunch of people living in a geographical area, it's all the same. But Indonesia is nothing like Vietnam in the way that Vietnam is nothing like the Philippines. 
And like you said, Brazil, people take it, take for granted, like it's right next to all these other countries, but they speak a completely different language and have different cultures. And I'm just curious, like, what are some of the challenges for you operating a business? I'm just going to say, because it's Latin America, you're right. Is it Latin America? Is it South America? Is it Central America? It's all very different. What are some of the challenges for you and the team about how to handle all those different countries, all the different customs, all those different things that go into running a business across all those borders? Yeah, first of all, we are planning to open Brazil like in the next few months, like in the next year, yep. but it is just a few months to, to end this year. But Brazil, it's, it's always like pretty different uh, something. So it is like very, very different than all the other countries in Latin America. But for example, in Mexico, Chile, Colombia, and Argentina, that are four, four countries that we operate there. Um, there are little things about tropicalization, tropicalization of, of, of like some some ones in, in Mexico, you say, hey, way. And in Argentina, you say, que onda chabón. And there are like different like dialects, yep. but, but the, the language is pretty the same. And the cultures are pretty the same. Okay. And the geographic of the cities are, are also pretty the same. Like in all the countries in Latin America, you have a, a very, very big city that is the, the capital of the country uh, that has at least the 70% of the volume. So okay. if you can focus in this, in this big, big city in each country, you just own the 70% of the volume that is shipped. So it is, we figured out how to, how to start in this, in these capital cities and then how to expand. And we, in, we started in Argentina, then Chile, then Mexico, and now we open, open in Colombia. Um, we made like a playbook that that we took to Chile, and then it will m be more perfect. We took to Mexico. We also perfectioned a little bit more, and then in Colombia, it was like a very soft and and, mo and smooth landing. Right, and, and a much smaller country as well. Can I ask you something about Chile? So one of the challenges that is faced in the Philippines and in Indonesia, and let's just use this Indonesia as an example. It's eighteen thousand islands. Right, so there's water in the way of everything right, just to get stuff around. So from a logistics standpoint, it's hard. But in Chile, it's very mountainous, right? So there are mountains running down like the whole country. Like what does what are the geographical boundaries? What kind of challenges do they cause? More than the mountains, the hard part about Chile, it is that they are like a pretty skinny line, yeah. like really, really, really skinny, but it is very yes. long. So if you want to go from from Santiago to the north, you have you may have like five thousand kilometers or four thousand kilometers to the northest point of of of, of Chile. Um, but but maybe one package a year is delivered to that part of, of yeah, Chile. No. So <laughs> we we operate the most and and we we. We do our delivery promise, our SLAs, like the service level agreements in Santiago and the nearest cities of Santiago, like Valparaíso, Viña del Mar, etc., that are the three biggest cities in Santiago, in Chile. And then the other ones, what we do is like not to promise a very short SLA, but to say, okay, it will arrive in the next two weeks. Please be patient. I will be noticing you every change of state of, the, of this yep. package but you you can't ask for a two-day delivery or a day a next day delivery because you are in the middle of nowhere <laughs> so that's how we manage it and at least at, at now, least now. Can, can i ask you can i ask you another thing though what is the state of e-commerce in the places where you operate and, and you can do country by country you can do the whole region i'm really curious about this you know one of the one of the things that martin and i talk about a lot is you know, is the end of innovation in e-commerce just a big marketplace or is it individual sellers or is it some kind of combination of both of those things? Like, what does it look like to you and to Clicko in the region where you operate? What does e-commerce look like and what do you think it should look like, I guess, is a better question. Yeah, starting it is a really good question. And I would say that I don't have the exact answer, but I have my point of view. Uh, because it is like a very difficult time to say what will happen in the next two years with e-commerce, if it will e-commerce survive or marketplace or both. 
but it is a really good question. In our, in in Latin America, the fun, the the first fact that I would the, want to say is that Latin America is the the most fast growing uh, e-commerce like penetration uh, from the whole retail in the yeah. world. So Latin America is the the fastest growing region in the world in in matters of of penetration e-commerce penetration in the retail. Um, but there are two big, very big marketplaces that are called Amazon. In Mexico, for example, Amazon operates in Mexico, but they don't operate in Chile and in Argentina. But there are there is another one that is a Latin American company that is called Mercado Libre. That is the biggest company in Latin America, and they are like cousins with Amazon, they, they are pretty the same. They do logistics, they do payments, and they do marketplace. And they have almost 50% of the of the packages that are shipped in all Latin America are from Mercado Libre. Uh, about seven to 10% is it's Amazon because they don't operate in, in all the region. They just operate in Mexico and some more countries, right. but Mercado Libre is in all the region, copates the region. But there and there are also two e-commerce platforms that are growing a lot. There are um, Shopify. Shopify is growing very, very much in, in Mexico and in Argentina most. And there is Tienda Nube, that is an, another uh, unicorn company from Argentina that is also growing a lot in, in, in e-commerce platform. Um, yeah, that that's how it looks Got like. It. And do you Look, you, you, you said you went to Y Combinator in December of 2020. So I'm curious, like what you learned or what changed in the e-commerce marketplace as you think during COVID. And as we come out now, I look at Shopify and its stock price is kind of predicting that it's going to go back on a normal growth trajectory as opposed to this explosive growth that we saw during the pandemic. I'm wondering if you're seeing the same types of things where you operate as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Mercado Libre, for example, it has like the same curve pattern uh, in the in the market stock. Like they they already went back. Like they were they, there is like a a, a grow a line of, of growth that was like very smooth, but then in in pandemic during pandemic it went like a peak, and then it it had like a rebound effect, and now it is like aiming the curve again and and we're still like growing at the same numbers that were growing before pandemic yeah. i think but they won't stop growing that that's for sure there will be always more e-commerce packages and e-commerce will penetrate more and more in, in the retail because it is what it, it is going to be and, in and the where future. Are most of your customers the fall? are the individual sellers that are using shopify or or some of these other platforms to build their stuff or is it the big platforms like i'm going to mispronounce it Mercola libre i i, I would say we have 40 marketplace 40 independent e-commerce and the 10 percent, the other 10 percent in amount of number of accounts of accounts uh the other 10% are big companies that have their own e-commerce, like self-development oh. e-commerce. Um, and, and yeah, that, that, that's the distribution of, of how we get the orders. Got it. Very interesting. And I'm really wondering, like, in the landscape where Shopify volumes and stock and the same for Mercado Libre went back to pre-pandemic levels, what does your investor tells you like do they uh, uh, have they like super con con confident into the growth of of of, of e-commerce are they like feeling super good about that or are they scared about the landscape like i'm really wondering like what kind of discussion do they have with you about the e-commerce landscape yeah i think this happened at the same time that all the the, the stock crisis came so mm -hmm. it is like it was not the the first worry uh, first thing to worry about the the the, the okay. drop from mercado libre because all the companies of our investors and all the investors in the world were, were dropping down so um, what happened most here in latin america not 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 just like hey 
you lied to me, your, your clients are dropping and your volume is dropping. No, it happened like they say, hey, stop bullshitting it. You start building a real company with solid growth, but not hyper growth, but at least growth with good margins. Like that's what they say to us. And, and y, YC, YC, for example, Michael Siebel, the president of YC, sent like a message. I don't know if you got it in Thailand, but it was like a global message that he says, guys, prepare for this crisis. For two or three years, you will not raise in money. You prepare your company for not raising any more in life. So you make a good business. You try to win money, to earn money. You have you need to have green numbers to good margins. And you don't expect tech to grow like really fast. Because if you do that, it is like a, a math that if you need to grow fast as, as fast as you want to grow, you will burn money. So if you want a, a clean business with, with efficient business, with good numbers, you need to, 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 to select the, the clients that you want that are the best ones for you. Don't, don't pick everything that is in market because some, some things are not, for, are not fit for you. So that, that's mm -hmm. mainly the, the, the change of strategy that, that happened here in Latin America. And I think in, in all the world it happened pretty the same yeah i feel like that announcement was really late from yc i mean I, and like the idea that you should build yeah it's the idea that you should build a company that just burns money until you somehow succeed feels anathema to me um you know martin's idea is always yeah. start something with a customer like try to get revenue right away yeah always, exactly I don't understand this idea <laughs> you first yeah, have the, yeah. the customer yeah but Get a paying customer, basically, right? Like get a paying customer who's really buying what you what you what you, what you are building, and then keep paying for it. And that's that's always my starting point. With everything I want to do, I'm like, okay, who's gonna pay for it? And even if it's not super ready yet, like let's get someone to pay for it, and yeah, then we have like, to build it, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I, yeah, this is but. Yeah, like this is really funny about to talk about that because I heard about this idea about like, building a profitable company for the first time, <laughs> I think like two years ago in an investment, you know, like a big conference. It, it was in Dubai and there was like a big VC, very famous, all of that. And he says something like that. He says that now you get to build a company that's like money, that is p profitable. And I was <laughs> this like, is a new what? Idea. <laughs> <laughs> is this something new? A like, profit, this a is really a new company? idea? <laughs> A profitable company, like this, I was wondering to myself, like, is there another way to build a company? <laughs> so yeah. I was really, really shocked, basically, two years ago when I heard that, and and I think that's very interesting, that especially into e-commerce, that that's that's yeah, that's the direction that company are like doing right now. Yeah, but it, but it is also like the real path, like in all the history of life, like companies are built to to earn money not to no. tell a story so in the past few years i think we were in a bubble that is mm -hmm. has blown up like in 20s in in, in 20s in 20 southern uh so yeah i think i think it is a good time to build a real company and that's where we are all trying to do so now, now that clico has finally decided like what it wants to do right you're super focused on <clears throat> the logistics side of it, the fulfillment side of it. Now that you're super ensconced into this e-commerce sort of facilitation business, right? It sounds to me a lot like what one of my investee companies out here does. It's called e-commerce. There are 3,000 people in it. It's taken them about 10 years, but they'll probably go public at some point. What are some of the, now that you're involved in this, right? I always say like, you can sit on the sidelines and say people can do this better, do that better, but you're running this business now, so you must have all these other ideas about how you can make stuff better in e-commerce. What is some of that stuff that you're looking at? Um, yeah, I, I have I have, I have learned something about e-commerce, also like shipping the, those packages and and seeing and watching what what were the the most successful e-commerces in in life. And I would say, like the most the most important things that you have to take in account are, are okay. three. I would say the first one is to build uh, confidence in the final customer because, like that, that's what happened with big marketplace. If you buy in Amazon, you know that if the package is wrong, if the product is broken, you can 
give it back to them. They will go to your home, pick it up, and then give you the money back and get the refund. And and people trust in marketplaces. But in e-commerce, it doesn't happen the same way. So it is very, very important to have a, a good UX and, and to don't show... Um, digital mistakes like maybe you have a column here and it is like a, a, a mislead by a little bit but the customer will say hey if they can even do a good pay web page how would they charge me or give me the money back yeah. if, if i want so it, it generates like a lot of of of, of yeah not 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 liked in, to to the customers so the first one is to have a good U, ux ui and 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 to have a a very nice web page so where with no mistakes with no errors with no developing errors mm -hmm. and the second thing i would say it is about building communities uh, like you you don't need a customer to buy you something and then never more so you need a customer that comes back yeah. and back and back that that come to your e-commerce so it is like building this confidence that I talked in the first place gets you to this second thing that is like, okay, you need to tell your friends what you're buying to me, that my products is good, that my products values, my, that my company values right. are your values. Yeah. You understand I me? Mean? So, so that's how you generate this, this personal feeling with, with, with the customer and thus make them to, to go back to you. Um, I, I I said that it was it was going to be three things, but I don't remember the last one. So that's okay. I've got another I've got another thing I want to ask you about. Martin and I have done a lot of work, and we've thought a lot about social selling, right? And I'm just really curious what you think about this. Is this a new thing that's going to happen and expand and be huge, or again, is it something that was just like people were stuck at home? So during the pandemic, they were like, "Hey, if I can make a video about my shoes, I can sell them." Or is it somewhere in the middle where it may take off, but we're not sure yet? And what do you think? Does it exist in in, in Latin America? Is there yeah. some some live sitting? Yeah, I, I, I've heard that that in Asia, social commerce is much more mm -hmm. big than that here in in Latin America. Like in India, like thirty percent of the volume is sold by by WhatsApp. I don't know, like something like that. Is mm -hmm. is it's crazy here in, in Latin America, not, not that much. Like we don't used to, to do much social commerce, but of course we have, um, I think it will survive because people always need to, to sell something they don't use or whatever, but that, that's how Mercado Libre started. For example, they started like a C2C business, like something, want to sell something, and someone wanna wanna like buy OLX. something, and and that was the, the first. Yeah, it was the first business model of market of Mercado Libre. But then they changed to a B two C model, like a B two B two C model, where yeah. where sellers sell to to companies. I, I think they will survive, but they will never be like this big part of the market share. I I don't disagree with you. What do you think about? Like, what is the mobile penetration like in the places where you operate? Do you know what I mean? Like, is most of the commerce done on mobile? Or are people sitting on laptops? Is it tablets? Yeah, you no. Know, and I like to ask because I'll tell you why. You know, my first introduction to the internet was on a, like a desktop computer. But my daughter's was really kind of on a tablet, right, or a phone. And I'm curious what it's like. And in Southeast Asia, for sure, it's mobile first, for sure. What's it like where you're operating? Yeah, it is like... I, I think mobile is overcoming just now through the the web, the web, the web uh, setting. Because yeah, I think mobile is is, is just going through uh, or, or winning. But this year, maybe or the last year before of that, it was I don't have the exact numbers, but it was much okay. more people that that used the laptop than than the ones that that had a phone. Got it. And does that change the way you do business at Clico? In other words, did you have to reinvent some of the stuff, some of the interfaces and stuff like that so that it was mobile ready or was that easy for you all to do? The thing is that as we don't sell to, to customers, just a second, sorry. There's the, the noise here. Um, the thing is that um, as we don't sell to, to customers directly, 
we don't yeah we don't get too much about if they buy through the phone or through the laptop but yeah. what we what the uh, one challenge that we had is it was like for example in pickup points in pickup points we needed an a scanner so just to to know when the package is, is ready in the in the pickup point so at first we did this web page but like the business needed like a, a, a mobile platform and we find out that the sellers the e-commerce sellers use much more the cell phone than the laptop they manage their own business. They, they manage their own business through the phone. So we started with a, a good web platform, a beautiful web platform with this, and you can have your metrics and you can manage your inventory and you can manage your shipping. And they say, hey, I use my phone. How, how, how can we do it? <laughs> So, okay, you need a, a mobile platform, yeah. That's what I thought. And what is the what is the payments like? Like, do you see yourselves... As you build out little pieces of the value chain, right, in the logistics, you also do warehousing because if you're picking and packing, you exactly. must write some optimization software to do that as well. And we'll get to robots in a second because we had a great conversation <laughs> about that too. But do you see yourself taking other little pieces of the value chain? Like should you have your own payments? Should you have your own settlement stuff? Well, I, I will start with, with the thing that – E-commerce, e it is building in three, it, it can be split it in three parts. It needs three right. parts. Like the first one is the selling, the, the, the web page, the platform where you sell to the customer. The second yeah. one is the checkout, the, the payment method, the, pay, the payment platform that it needs to be as good as the market, as the marketplace. Because yeah. if you don't have this like really good, well designed, people won't trust you. And the third part is logistics. So you have the selling, the payment and the logistics and the shipping. And by now we don't want to misfocus ourselves. So we are focusing just on logistics, just on shipping, because it is not the most important part, but as important as selling this product and paying this product. So we have like a really, really awesome challenge here. Um, and, and then we may plan to to something like we want what we want is to create a, a an ecosystem for the seller where they can like just sell things they sell the product and we take care of all the rest we we are planning yeah. to to have like um loans for credit for for sellers we have like some things in in our in our future but but we are still focused on, on logistics, pure logistics. Okay, but that, that, that makes sense. And that's why I wanted to ask you that, right? It's like you can start with this, dominate in this, but at some point your sellers are going to say, <clears throat> if I had a little bit more working capital, that would be neat. And you're already with them. Because this gets back to the other thing that I want to bring up. At some point, all these e-commerce facilitation companies, which is what you're doing, right? You're facilitating e-commerce, making it easier so that exactly. if I have a product and I want to sell it, I just figure out how to do that. And you kind of do everything else for me, right? And my margins are big enough so that I can pay you for all these little microservices and I can still, I can still make a profit. But at some level, you are gathering or sharing all this data. Martin and I ask about this all the time. The longer you're in business, the more data you get. And then the more services you can provide based on that data, what does that look like to you besides the loans and stuff like that? Like, what are your customers asking you for from a dashboard perspective, from a data perspective? Yeah, and that's where you touch like a really good point. And we don't think that data will be used for a dashboard for the seller. It may be like a nice to have thing for them. But the most important thing, what we want to do with this data that we are, that we are like building and, and saving, it is um, to store close to the demand so we can improve our SLAs. You know, if you know where people buy more cosmetics, for example, you can store cosmetic, cosmetic customers in, in this region that sells like much more cosmetics than the other ones. And you can store the inventory very close to the demand and we can improve. Our objective is to have like, right now you can buy 
lettuce or a tomato and it arrives you at home in 15 minutes in half an hour we want to do the same but with e-commerce we want to if you ask for a new shoes or a new gift for your grandma and you forget to buy something you can ask for it through the internet and you you have your your new glasses for example so this is a really good point and i actually tweeted this today are there enough people that need enough things in 15 minutes that it's worth it for you to build that 15 minute delivery thing? Do you know what I mean? Like there's sometimes, and Martin and I talk about this too, we're at a venue, we're like, oh, shucks. I mean, we never forget cables, but let's say we did forget like an XLR cable. We do like, oh my God, we need one. We don't have time to go yeah. buy one. If I could have it in 15 minutes, it would be perfect. But maybe it happens once a year. I'm just curious because you do this every day. Is there a big enough need? Because, you know, a company in, I think it was in India, just went bankrupt or a company in Sri Lanka or wherever, Bangladesh just went bankrupt because they were like 15 minutes is what everybody needs. But based on what you see, what do you think? Do people really need this at scale? If uh, th there is a, a good phrase from Henry Ford that said, mm -hmm. if I would ask I if people. I, I know if I asked all my customers well, what they wanted, they would have yeah. said faster horses. I got it. Exactly. But, that, exactly. but I'm still That's asking you, like, what do you think? I think that it will never be like you will never have all all the things that you buy through the internet in this in this yeah. type of of SLA because the thing is that you need like a lot of units and little SK, SKUs because you need to have like a few products a lot of volume of those products distributed yep. in all the in all the star stores right. or, or warehouses or micro fulfillment centers um, but we think it can be possible for, for some products, like maybe most of them. Uh, as I say, if you if we work, we are working with Ryvan, for example, and Ryvan has like maybe 10 SKUs that they sell the more, and then they have like these rare uh, models. But those those 10 SKUs, we can distribute it in, in half an hour, maybe, or in an hour. And I think, as Henry Ford said, they don't need it right now, but when you get used to that, you just can't go back to. So when you get used to your mobile phone, you can go back to the laptop or do the desktop. Do you do you have your own warehouses? Do you have like branded Clicko warehouses? Is that a business you want to be in, or are you just going into other people's warehouses and managing it for them? Because you're picking and packing as well, yeah. Yeah, we have we have both. Okay. Uh, we have some good partnerships with with, where, with already existing warehouses where we take over them. Like we give them our technology. We do like the training to the pickers and the packers so they can do all the processes that, that we plan them to do. And we also have our own warehouses. Like you always need to have, what we learn is that you always need to have your own stuff like at least at, at backup you may you may like uh, uh, try to to be in, in you may try to help to be helped with some three three pl but you always need your own warehouse at least to have a backup because if they go away you you still have your business running do you advise the e-commerce sellers as well, right? Again, you have all this data and you can see things that they can't see because they can just see their business, but you can see, I'm guessing, I don't know, a thousand, I don't know how many businesses you work with, but a lot of them. Do you do advisory as well? I mean, not necessarily for payment, but if you can just say to someone like, hey, you know, if you reorganize the way you did this, you could sell a lot more stuff kind of thing. Exactly. I, I won't say like you can sell more stuff because as I already said, we don't get in the in the in the selling yeah, part. Exactly. So so we don't have like grid there. But we do recommend them to store uh, maybe in Buenos Aires or maybe in Cordoba, that's the second largest city in Argentina. Right. Uh, it de depending in, in the demand. So that makes them more cost effective, makes the shipping much more cost effective. Because if you have to do one kilometer to deliver a package, it's not the same if you have to do eight, 800 kilometers to deliver a package. So they like have better costs. Got it. And do you help your sellers as well with cross-border sales? I'm in Mexico. I want to sell in Ch Ch Chile. Can Kiko handle that for me? I mean, shipping, customs, taxes. all of that, taxes. 
that's a good, that's a good one and, and we are and we are also like mapping this this cross border uh, service but not still if we do I, I just have to say that we will do it with uh, partnerships where there are some pretty good companies from Y Combinator that do cross border only cross border so like we may partner them there are some of them like Meru or Nowport there are big companies here that do the cross border but the thing is that right now what we do is to encourage our our customers to go to other country to open the, the other country we can help them with the export export part for example but we do help them in the region once they get there but yeah that's very interesting because i think like this is this is huge for online sellers, right? Like I'm, I'm working with, with online sellers every day. And one thing that I can tell is that they always see small, like, you know, in, in big quote, but they are so busy with their own market first, right? That they don't really think about expanding it to other countries and they have no idea on how to do that, like really no idea at all. So if they are French and they sell in Europe, then that's kind of easy because you know the world your european system makes make logistics and deliveries of, of goods very easy but if you really want to sell to the us or if you want to sell to asia or to latin america then the sellers have absolutely no idea on how to do that and in fact if that's exactly what amazon is doing here in thailand they are helping thai yeah. merchants just to sell abroad that's the only thing that they do and i think this is a very very interesting thing because once again merchants have absolutely no idea that they can do that it's it's absolutely not like a possibility of growth from their point of view because they have no idea where, where to start they have no idea on on how to do it and i think if we can help them to facilitate these cross borders sales then it can open giant gigantic growth opportunities for them because it's because it's it's much easier i think if you sell for example for already a million dollar a year in france it's much easier to go to another million dollar in, in germany in spain and in, 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 it, in, in italy than to go from one to five in france, just yeah. in france all right so the growth opportunities to cross borders i think is huge and nobody knows how to, to do that and really tackle that for dtc companies and i would like to know what's your point of view on that as well <laughs> yeah no but i, I i'm 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 the, the same the same as you but I, I think that what we do is to we advise them like we had some customers that that were running their business only in argentina and we said hey you need to come to mexico what do you need you need logistics we have logistics you need payments we have a friend that that do a payments uh, plan so we help them to start their business in other countries uh, with the most important clients. We, we advise them and help them to build their, their own platform in the other country because you also can't do the same, can use the same platform that you use in Argentina. You can use the same platform in Mexico. You, you need to build another platform in Mexico with different prices, with different uh, coins. So, um, uh, but but yeah, it, it is a really, really huge market. In Latin America, the regulations are not that easy. That's why like, it gets pretty difficult to, to, to transport a, a package from Argentina to Mexico, for example. Uh, in Argentina, if you want to import something, it is like 160% of taxes. taxes like it yeah. is, yeah, and, and it is yeah. like pretty pretty unwayable like unbeable but but yeah it is it is like for sure a big opportunity to e-commerce uh, to expand their business yeah for sure just the, we just need to figure out how to do it well and with with good cost and margins but at least everybody speaks the same language which makes it every awesome. very very easy like yeah it's it's a Brazil, but exactly. all, all, of the, all of the countries will speak Spanish, like at least that's made like the web's website, like you don't need to translate and yeah. all that. So like the customer support as well, it's only into one language. So I guess it's, it's helped a little bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah we, we have some customers that already did like four or five customers. We know that we took two of them from Argentina to Mexico and then two of them from Mexico to Chile, for example, and one from Mexico to Argentina. It is like. We try to do with the most important customers and the ones that wanted 
they, they want to do it. But but yeah, we, we are we help them <laughs> as much as we can. <laughs> okay, one more thing from me before I let you go, unless Martin has more. Always have more. What is the most important factor for growth for Clico? I think we we share the growth with the e-commerce growth. So if the e-commerce, if our customers grow, we grow because we have all the all the shippings of their sales. Um, and how we try to encourage our our so so we need to grow the e-commerce and how we do that by building this confidence in the in the final consumer. So. I, I, we have like a customer service, a customer experience service, like very, very good, as good as the operation service. So if the final customer, final, uh, yeah, in the final user needs whatever they need, like where's my package, uh, at what time it will be arrived, I need to change my address, like whatever they need, we try to provide them because if they are confident about buying something in, in the e-commerce that is our customer, we will grow. And for example, what I said about the loans, uh, we, we are the lead, we are developing like there is something called powered by Clico, yeah. that is like an assurance, a guarantee, a guarantee of quality that we measure the standards of our customers' products and and we like put them like uh, from one to five stars and. We are trying to to get that so final consumers can because that's what what Amazon do like they have their 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 their, their opinions and their their quality assurance and we we need we are trying to do the same but for independent e-commerce and the other one for example the loans for sellers if we uh, so if you if we give them money is for them to buy more more and more inventory and they will give us their inventory so if they grow we grow got it. Ileana Segura, a co-founder and the CTO at Clico. Thank you so much for doing that. That was awesome. Uh, thank you. Thank you, both of you. It was really nice to chat and meet you. Thank you.